I now move on to the final section of my webinar, which is the on an application example of a TDF emitter. So characterization of these materials involves all the techniques that we just saw previously uh, put into action. So I'm sure everybody here is very familiar with organic light emitting diodes. They're now one of the most popular uh, display technologies for both mobile devices uh, and also television screens and indoor lighting. And there's extensive research into making these more efficient in both academia and industry. When electrons and holes recombine in an OLED, uh, due to spin statistics, 75% of the excitons, electron hole pairs, are, end up in the triplet state and only 25 in the singlet. So if we have an OLED that's based on a fluorescence process, this limits the maximum efficiency of the OLED to 25%. This is obviously not desirable. And so second generation OLEDs were made, which incorporated uh, heavy metals to promote inter-system crossing and uh, triplet transitions. So these second generation work through phosphorescence from the triplet state, but the downside is that there's no stable blue emitter and they require the reduce the use of rare heavy metals to facilitate these transitions. And so there's a lot of research at the moment looking into third generation OLEDs, uh, which are based on thermally activated delayed fluorescence, which is this process what we saw earlier in the webinar of inter-system crossing followed by reverse inter-system crossing. And these have a maximum efficiency of 100% with no heavy metals required and there's the search for stable blue high efficiency emitters. The FLS 1000 is ideal for characterizing these TDF emitters. So all the examples here are this uh, CZDBA emitter uh, that we we got from a, through a collaboration. And the FLS 1000 can be used to characterize the photophysical properties of these emitters. So for simple uh, spectral measurements, the absorption and emission spectrum can be measured. And more importantly, the photoluminescence quantum yield can be measured using the FLS 1000. So the photoluminescence quantum yield tells you how efficient a emitter it is. It's the ratio of the number of photons absorbed to the number of photons emitted. And this is crucial for developing high efficiency OLEDs because the external quantum efficiency of the OLED is directly proportionable to the photoluminescence quantum yield. And the photoluminescence quantum yield can be measured using the integrating sphere accessory of the FLS 1000. And there's two options. We either have the standard sphere, which works at room temperature, and we also have a cryosphere for temperature dependent photoluminescence quantum yield from 77 to 500 Kelvin. In the integrating sphere, the sample is excited from either the monochromator or a laser. The sample emits uh, photoluminescence or scatters the light. And from the integrating both the photoluminescence 
and the scatter, the photoluminescence quantum yield can be determined. So for the CZDBA TDF emitter, we measured a photoluminescence quantum yield of 25% in a degassed solution and 13% in a non-degas solution. Due to the reverse inter-system crossing process, TDF emitters have unique temporal PL behavior, which makes time-resolved photoluminescence very powerful to study them. When a TDF emitter is excited, it's promoted from the singlet ground state to the singlet excited state, and it can then either undergo prompt fluorescence, which occurs on a nanosecond time scale, or undergo intersystem crossing, followed by reverse intersystem crossing back to the singlet excited state with delayed fluorescence. And you get this by exponential behavior and the PL decays. So you have an initial fast component with a short lifetime, which is the prompt fluorescence and a longer lifetime component, which is the delayed fluorescence that is undergoing reverse inter-system crossing. So both uh, this decay was measured using an EPL 375 and it was measured using the MCS mode in order to rapidly acquire the decay. One of the key pieces of information that the lifetime data can be used to tell you is the ratio of the quantum yield of the prompt and delayed component. So when you measure the quantum yield in the integrating sphere, the total photoluminescence quantum yield is measured and you don't know how much of that is prompt and how much is delayed. However, by fitting the lifetime, you can calculate the ratio of the emission that's due to the prompt and the ratio is due to the delayed. And then by applying these ratios to the total photoluminescence quantum yield, you can calculate that the prompt fluorescence has a quantum yield of 14% for this emitter while the delayed fluorescence contributes 11% to the quantum yield to give a total of 25% PLQI. And so this is information that the lifetime data can be used to supplement the integrating sphere data. Another measurement that's very useful for the characterization of TDF emitters is to do a time-resolved emission spectrum. So this is where the photoluminescence decay of the emitter is measured as a function of emission wavelength. So on the x-axis here, we have time, which is the time axis of the decay, on the y-axis is wavelength. And we can see this color plot showing how the decay varies as a function of wavelength. And to acquire these TRES spectra, measuring the decay using the EPL and MCS mode is a big advantage because these decays take quite a lot of time and MCS mode allows them to be acquired more rapidly. If we take a slice of this decay at 100 nanoseconds, we can look at the prompt fluorescence and four microseconds to look at the delayed fluorescence. And comparing these slices, we can see that they give identical spectra. And this confirms 
that we are looking at prompt and delayed fluorescence. So it shows that both uh, the microsecond and the, the nanosecond component originate from the same excited state because they have the same spectral shape. The FLS1000 can be also fit with a cryostat to do temperature dependent photoluminescence. So, as I mentioned earlier, there's this reverse intersystem crossing process where the population from the triplet is thermally assisted back to the singlet. And since this is a thermally assisted process, its efficiency varies with temperature. And so using a, a cryostat and the FLS1000 allows you to characterize this transition. Here are the photoluminescence decays measured at two different temperatures, 77 and 300. So we can see that the delayed fluorescence component at 300 K is present, but when we go to 77 Kelvin, it ceases. Uh, and this is because the reverse intersystem crossing is turned off. And if we look at the phosphorescence, we can see the opposite behavior. At at 300 Kelvin, there's no phosphorescence component because all the triplet population has been removed uh, through reverse ester system crossing back to the singlet. And so no phosphorescence occurs at 300. But when we cool the sample to 77 Kelvin, the reverse ester system crossing is turned off and we get phosphorescence emission. And so using an FLS1000 equipped with a cryostat and doing lifetime measurements, you can investigate the dynamics and kinetics of this reverse intersystem crossing transition. One final, uh, important uh, parameter to measure in TADF research is the phosphorescence spectrum. So by measuring the spectrum of the fluorescence and phosphorescence, you can calculate the energy level splitting uh, between the singlet state and the triplet state. And by using a VPL laser and the gated PMT that we discussed earlier, we can measure the low temperature fluorescence and phosphorescence spectrum of the TDF emitter. So here is the photoluminescence decay of the emitter measured at 80 Kelvin. So we have really two components, the prompt fluorescence and a phosphorescence. And then we want to measure the spectrum of these two components. So we can use detector gating uh, as shown earlier. So if we set the gate delay to zero milliseconds with a width of 0 0.5, then we're gonna be measuring predominantly the prompt fluorescence, which gives you the fluorescence spectrum of the sample shown in black. And if we then change the gate delay to five, milliseconds with a width of 50, we'll be measuring within the phosphorescence time scale, and you can measure the phosphorescence decay. And this allows you to fully characterize their matter. That brings me to the end of my talk today. Thank you very much for your attention. And if you have any questions, please feel free to ask.